Tristan, thank you for taking the time to be with us today and welcome to the NYC Media Lab virtual stage. Let's just start by talking about the film. So when you make a documentary, there's always this fear that it's going to be seen by three people and, and, and it's not going to have an impact. This film is a top 10 Netflix film. Is that a surprise? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, it's a complete surprise. We actually first aired the film at Sunday and that we weren't sure where it was going to get distributed. You know, we, we thought we were going to be in theaters. We meant people to spend $11 and show up with their friends to go to the theater and then have, you know, a dinner afterwards and conversation go out. We were going to have a whole plan around getting people to um, go have real face-to-face -face conversations with friends. We weren't even sure this was going to be picked up by Netflix. Um, and the ironic thing about um, the pandemic and uh, coronavirus is that Netflix's subscribers went up by about 20% since the beginning of, um, of the pandemic. And the film um, coming out uh, when it did in September released in 190 countries and in 30 languages, I think it's had an unprecedented reach for a documentary. I think it's broken records on Netflix. And we never anticipated, really, genuinely, that it would break through this way um, on multiple counts. Um, one is, you know, I didn't anticipate it would break through and become, for example, it was the number one film in India and Canada, Lebanon last week. Um, and we used to pay a resident to one to So do you find it ironic that one of the ways people are learning about your film is through Facebook? Um, it's certainly ironic. It's interesting because um, it's actually what's led to the viral growth of the film. Um, I think, even if I think about, you know, the films that were the most influential documentary films I've ever seen in my life, or the best films I've ever seen in my life, just because they impacted me that deeply wouldn't mean that I would turn to social media to talk about it. Um, that's, I'm not that kind of person. But this film, because of its content, almost encourages people to go to social media and people say, hey, what do you, what do you all think about this? Um, and so I think there's two reactions. Um, one is I'd say about 10% of people after seeing the film delete their accounts, which is much higher than I probably anticipated. Um, although that's not the goal. We can talk more about that if you'd like. Uh, and the other side of it is I never anticipated this much um, chatter on social media uh, to talk about it. And, um, I, you know, I think you might point out or say that this is hypocrisy for people to be talking about it on social media, but I don't mind using uh, the tools to reveal the pathology of the tools. I think it's important that we use the tools that we have uh, as we have them. So talk about, Eric and I were talking about this earlier before we got you online. Talk about the word dilemma. Like, was there a list of 50 other words and Dilemma was the one that got lifted to the top of the pile? Um, well, that's filmmaker's choice. So I just want to make clear, um, yeah. you know, I'm not the filmmaker. Um, I'm a featured subject in the film. And it's obviously large, largely based on our diagnosis of the broader problems in technology. Um, I actually thought that it should not be called the social dilemma because it makes it seem unsolvable or like there's no answer. Oh, I guess it's a dilemma, so we don't know what to do. And I, I wish the film had more of um, an answer at the end that helps, not an answer, but a, a kind of a pathway towards a more humane future that we got to more explicitly um, lay out. But um, unfortunately, we ran out of time. Um, the filmmakers rushed to get it uh, released before Sundance. They literally shipped to Sundance a copy of the film where there was cartoon stand-ins for all the parts where the um, Vincent Kartheiser, the advertising AI, artificial intelligence, um, wasn't even there in the original cut that they sent to Sundance to get admitted. Uh, and so uh, in, in the rush to get this out, um, there was a lot of sacrifices that had to get made. But I think everyone felt it was important that this film come out before the election. We've heard from people uh, who said instead of watching the presidential debates for 90 minutes, which was just a shouting match and a kind of a, you know, a really horrible vision of where our democracy might be at, um, people have been saying, I'm going to spend those 90 minutes watching The Social Dilemma with my family. And that's actually a more useful and productive way to establish common ground with family members that they lost uh, the ability to talk to. So I think that's that's been an exciting uh, trend as well. So Erica, we've got some questions coming in from the audience that are currently in our Slack channel. Do you want to dig into those and we'll, we'll include the audience in this conversation? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, let's go to some audience questions. Um, speaking of Facebook, um, have you read the two-page response, uh, Facebook's official two-pager response to the Social Dilemma film? And what are your thoughts on it? Um, I don't have developed talking points about it, but I was sent it last Friday. They released it on a low, on a high news day and then the Friday afternoon, I think, hoping that no one would see it. Um, most of the people who sent it to me found it to be a ridiculous defense. Um, so I don't think you have to actually really go point by point because it's so clearly, um, you know, not very defensible. Um, the idea that we are not the product, we are somehow the customer and that there's just advertising accompanying our use of the product. Uh, this is definitely not true. Um, we know that, you know, they do do user resurrection emails. If you, for example, say things like, uh, you know, you want to delete your account, you'll notice that you're presented with an interstitial that says, are you sure you want to delete your account? And it usually holds up five photos of your friends who will be most likely to persuade you that you um, would, would lose access to those five people. Um, that is persuasive design. That is not, that is like a digital drug lord who says, before you leave, let me just entice you with, uh, with a little bit more. Uh, and I think that is anything but we're being the customer, but the rather the product. So I have a personal question. You know, there are people who are uh, evangelists and activists who spend their whole life protesting and writing documents and trying to raise issues. You strike me as uh, someone who found themselves, you know, standing on the street with a bucket of water and seeing a fire and going, well, if I don't put it out, like, 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 is this a role that you imagined yourself in? And are you happy in it or is it seem like it was, you know, an inevitability, like a far, like a house fire? Um, yeah, I appreciate the, this question. I, you know, I, I started looking at these problems back in 2012, 2013, um, concerned that, um, you know, back in those days, if you remember, it was kind of the heyday of social media apps being built. Uh, Path was being built. Um, Instagram was developing um, Snapchat. And more and more of these apps were really, um, really deeply exploiting human psychology. I remember a moment I was at the Harvard School of Education with um, a woman who studied um, uh, teenagers' use of, of Snapchat. And she was talking about their experiences with streaks, and she was doing some big academic analysis of it. And I remember just saying, it's not about the academic analysis of it. I know this playbook. I know how they're, they're manipulating kids. And this is going to keep going on if we don't fix it. And I remember really not wanting to get into this work because I, it was just such an impossible set of issues to ever turn um, and had many mentors who said, you know, this is just so massive. How, how can this ever change? And it was really, I think, after 2016 and into 2017 that I realized that this just absolutely had to change. And no matter what it would take, we had to keep fighting for it. And honestly, um, the film is, is just such a surprising culmination of that because in, I, I never anticipated, it almost feels like when it launched, there was this kind of global sweeping tsunami of consciousness and self-awareness that swept over the internet. Like Justin Rosenstein, who's in the film, um, said it, it feels like the internet is becoming self-aware. It's becoming aware of itself um, because the film is sort of exposing um, you know, what we've all been trapped inside of. Instead of being in the madness, we can put the, create the madness as an object and say, this is why this has happened. Um, and I think that's the most inspiring thing that's come from the work, frankly, in the last eight years of this long, long pathway, because uh, it's, it's pretty hopeless when you, when you keep pushing the boulder up, uphill, and sometimes it actually does move uphill. And I think now there's 190 countries moving it uphill, and that, that's really exciting. So, I, I want to dig into this because you have a lot of colleagues who feel, who saw what you saw, got paid enormous salaries, you know, feel badly about their work at these various platforms and essentially, you know, wring their hands, but don't do much like, you know, and there've been some, some resignation, like, like, like what's the neck, what's the critical audience that's going to make change? I mean, developers quit, they hire other developers. Um, how, how does the industry, not, not the audience now, let's shift to tech, people in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. How do people in the tech industry impact this? Yeah. Um, well, so 
when we think about impacting this and how do we shift the internal um, employee culture, this is very much like transitioning off of an entire fossil fuel based economy. We have an entire economy that is coupled with the success of surveillance capitalism and um, businesses whose business model is to predate on human instincts and, and cause the problems that the film describes. So much like if you're trying to change climate change, you need to work with all the fossil fuel companies and turn them as much as you can into carbon capture, um, you know, uh, climate reversing uh, companies. And so that means you need the help and assistance of people who are on the inside of the companies to do as much good as they can while they're there. As you said, if you're too successful and the people end up burning out and quitting, then you just have less and less people running a system that is still managing our public square for an election, for example. So, you know, we've actually joked that, you know, you have to be careful with chemotherapy because you're both, how do you not kill the patient while you're killing the cancer? And I think the cancer here is the business model that is fundamentally toxic. The patient is our democracies that this cancer has taken over. And as we inject, you know, these different, um, you know, cultural awareness vaccines and do the mobilization work that we've been doing, you know, before this film, we have been... Um, uh, hosting many, many dinners, uh, convenings, background conversations with people who are in the tech industry. And when the film was made, it's important people know that it was um, uh, most of the interviews you see were, were filmed two and a half to three years ago, um, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. Uh, and there weren't really many that many that many people speaking out back then. So, uh, you know, I think while there's a few more people who've been speaking out recently. There's not nearly enough. And one of the things that we're hearing and we've deliberately cared about is the, the, the talent pipeline going into these companies. So there's, we're seeing computer science students not actually wanting to work at the surveillance technology, surveillance capitalism uh, companies uh, and asking tougher questions and saying, what do I really want to do? I'm getting emails right now from thousands of um, people and engineers and people who are saying, you know, I, I was going to go in, I already worked in social media advertising or in the dark side of the advertising markets, and I feel like I need to change. We're hearing, hearing from people who started tech companies who used to be tempted by venture capitalists who said, we want you to go down the direction of um, using all this data to, to exploit people. And they're actually having a wake up call. And so what's amazing about film as a medium for changing um, how systems work is that you're wrapping a new cultural context around every single constituency. So venture capitalists, engineers, the next generation of computer scientists and designers and product managers, um, uh, the media, parents, uh, you know, policymakers, uh, you know, changing broad scale cultural awareness really is, I think, a, a, the most powerful change agent you can get if you can translate it. And that's what we're struggling with now is how do we translate all of this global awareness into a mobilized uh, um, power-based group. T talk about this phrase, humane technology. Is, I mean, do you have a thousand employees at the Center for Humane Technology? Um, you know, it, it, names are deceiving. We, we are um, a small group of something like seven to eight people or a nonprofit. Can we donate? Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, if people would like to donate, we would we would love um, some some help and source uh, resourcing. We're we're actually one thing I would love to see that we didn't get time to do, frankly, is start up. Um, it's for your kind of last question. Start a, a tech regrets fund, because as you said, there's a lot of people who've made money off of this problem, and I think that we need better ways of funneling it, not just to Center for Humane Technology, but to the large group of research researchers. Um, and many of the voices who were not included in the, in the film, by the way, because there's obviously um, many um, uh, diverse, uh, discriminated uh, groups that are, that are not represented in the film, and those harms are not represented in the film. And I think there needs to be a huge fund to um, support the important work that many of those groups have been doing for a long time. Um, uh, but yeah, we are, we are just a small group of about seven people and trying eagerly to turn that into a slightly bigger group and mobilize uh, a much bigger audience. Well, thank you very much, Erica. One last question from from your side of the world, and then we'll move forward. Sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. Maybe if we can just conclude. Thank you, Tristan, so much for your time. I guess a lot of people sort of similar to I think our conversation. What's one call to action um, that you'd like to leave us with? Maybe one or two. <laughs> yeah. Well, so first of all, I want people to know that. Yeah. 
I know that a lot of people see the film and they might feel powerless. Um, that's what, one of my biggest fears is that it leaves people in a feeling of anxiety or powerlessness. And we really care about changing the system. Um, one of the things I wish I could do is show everyone my inbox because the number of messages that we get from all around the world, you know, it used to be that there was a small number of people, I think, who really saw this and were worried about it. And if only a small number of people see it, it's never going to change. But if the entire world understands that this is a train that's going nowhere, um, I think, you know, we're all in the same boat together. We used to joke that we're all on team humanity. Some people just haven't realized it yet because we don't get anywhere when we're in a self-terminating um, system. So, um, you know, on the small side, I'd say the hope is that um, the things that people can do are to host a screening of the film, especially with people who've not, who are likely not to see it. So think about family members or people in parts of the country or around the world who maybe don't have a Netflix account um, and screen it and actually host a conversation about it. We're seeing people after they watch the film do a reality swap. So it's like Freaky Friday. You open up Facebook on both your phones with someone you disagree with, and then you swap realities. And you step into their world to see what, you know, why do they think the things they're thinking? Well, you scroll through their feed and you see they're not seeing the same information that I'm seeing. And that's a visceral way, I think, to have that experience. Uh, we also just updated our Take Control page on our website, which has a um, lot of more meaningful ways to live on inhumane platforms. Because one of the things, just lastly to say, is that the growth rate of these harms of conspiracy theories, of addiction and mental health of kids, that's growing like this. And the product changes we're seeing from the platforms is going kind of slow. It's not really changing very much at all. Obviously, it's against their business interest. And also regulation is moving fairly slowly. You know, over the last six years, we've seen privacy legislation, but not much else dealing with the problems that are presented in the film. So when the growth rate of these two curves diverge, um, the, the thing that we really need, the thing that scales to the challenge is a cultural awakening, a, a cultural movement that knows that we are living on inside of inhumane technology platforms and we need a humane protocol about how we show up in those platforms. Uh, and I, we'd love to co-create that with the community. Um, I think the Take Control page is one start. We also just, to mention, we have a podcast called Your Undivided Attention, where we've, we've actually shot through the roof to the number one tech podcast, I think, uh, on Apple. And, um, and that's actually where we interview and educate you know, the, the audience about um, many of these other harms. We interview subjects that are in the film for, for more than an hour um, to go really deep into Russian disinformation, into um, attention spans, into the casino-like design patterns. Um, so that's been really successful. And overall, it's just, you know, for people to ask themselves, really, at the end of the day, what is worth my attention? Um, because I think that's the critical thing here. So long as a whale is worth more dead than alive and a tree is worth more as lumber than as a tree, you know, now we're the whale, we're the tree, we're worth more when we're addicted, outraged, polarized, and disinformed than if we're a thriving citizen of a democracy or a healthy kid that's growing up um, with a lot of community support. So I think each of us can ask ourselves the question, you know, what is worth our attention? And hopefully it's uh, been worth that uh, coming here today, even with our technical difficulties. I love the idea of doing a reality swap. I think that's genius. And I think it would be absolutely shocking to people how different the world looks depending on what the platform decides to feed you. So thank you very, Completely. very much for kicking up for our event, for helping us get off on an important, thoughtful note, and also for the work that you do. Tristan, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephen and Eric. Really, really great to be here.